Andrew Maslowski with AAM Insight. Today, my guest is Israeli journalist and author David Grossman. His newest novel, To the End of the Land, was recently published in English to much critical acclaim. Mr. Grossman, welcome. Good to be here. When you sat down to write this newest novel, was there a particular message you were hoping to convey or something you wanted readers to take away from it? I never look for a message. I just want to tell a good story. Uh, and I, I wanted to, to describe two layers of our reality there in Israel. One is the, the bigger sphere, the bigger dimension of the conflict, the almost everlasting conflict between us and the Palestinians, us and the Arabs, uh, wars and terror acts and occupation and uh, existential fear. But I was even more interested in describing a life of a family. I'm, I'm always, in all my writing, I'm fascinated by families. I think that the, the family is the, the greatest drama of humanity. And I wanted to show how this long, violent conflict, conflict projects itself, radiates itself into the, the very tender bubble of, of one family and what it does to it. So that was the beginning. I guess to elaborate a bit on that, you know, in Into the End of the Land, there's very prominent universal themes like love, loss, uh, war, conflict. Um, could you speak a bit more then about the themes or elements of the novel that are very much particular to the time and place in which you wrote it? More than any, everything, uh, the cost of life, of private and intimate life, in, uh, in a catastrophe zone, in a zone of war. Uh, the fear for our beloved ones. Uh, how difficult it is to maintain routine, normality, when reality is so abnormal and so extreme. How hard it is to preserve the, the, the tenderness of human relationship the attentiveness to, to the, the uniqueness of every human being, when actually the climate of war is a climate that obliterates the, the face of the individual. Uh, I wanted to show what happened to individuals and to a collective, a society that's, that has to live all their life in, in war how they inevitably and without noticing it, they, they minimize the surface of their soul that comes to contact with reality because reality hurts. And, and instinctively, you, 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 know, you close yourself down and you narrow yourself and you don't want to come, become in contact with it. And how gradually people stop to believe that there is another alternative. And they believe that this is the only reality that is possible for them. No, no other option. And in that moment, they, they have lost the war in a way. And all that I, I try to show through three or four characters uh, who desperately almost try to, to keep, to maintain love and, and tenderness and compassion towards each other. And yet, the power of war is stronger. One of the primary characters in, in your novel is, is Ora. Yeah. And she walks, it's called the Israel Trail, um, starting in, in the north of the country. Uh, something you yourself did in, in 2004. Um, was there something about the experience of walking that trail that inspired the novel? I, I did not know exactly what the novel will be about when I started to walk there. But I can tell you that it was probably the best part of writing it, being alone in nature. I never, I was not a very, uh, I was not a person of nature. I was more an urban person. I, I don't, didn't know to navigate my way. And, and suddenly I found myself in the Galilee alone. And I started walking and, and it was okay. I mean, I found my way and I was able to, uh, avoid all kind of dangers and I gradually became quite articulate about walking in the nature and in a way for me it was a way of renewing the contract between me and Israel a contract that I felt 
had been violated and not by myself. And then being there, seeing these landscapes and seeing the, the beautiful parts or the beautiful face of Israel, that was something. In a recent New Yorker piece, uh, George Packer, the, the author, notes that two Israeli figures sort of on opposite sides of the political spectrum both told you that this most recent novel is, is their novel. Um, why do you think that is? I think it's because the book is not, cannot be uh, related to, to any party. It is a very political book. At the same time, it is a very anti-political book against the, the terrible consequences that politics has upon our life. But Ora, the main character, sometimes she is extreme right-winger. Sometimes she's totally to the left, much more than myself, by the way. And she moves very tenderly and, and naturally between the contrary positions because she does not think she has to be entrenched in one political opinion. You know, sometimes we become prisoners of our political positions, especially in, in Israel when the situation is so acute and it is harder. I mean, maybe it's easier to change your gender than to change your political stand. And, and by allowing yourself to, to feel all the feelings that the situation arouses with all the inner contradictions of the situation. Uh, she is in much more real contact with reality. She, she really behaves like a human being, not like, you know, a, a puppet of the situation. If I may, while you were in the process of, of writing this novel, um, your family suffered a great loss. Um, did this affect your writing in any way or its reception? People ask me if it uh, has changed uh, the story, and I say that it has changed the writer, mainly. Uh, I cannot say that it changed the book. The, the idea of the book was before uh, my son Uri fell, uh, and the ending of the story was clear to me even before. I think it, it created an atmosphere of acuteness in, in my writing, of... of sharper urgency because of what I've experienced. And I guess that it, it, I mean, it will continue to change me from now on because such an experience uh, changes everything uh, one knows and one feels regarding life, regarding the proximity of life and death. From the beginning, I, I wanted to tell a story about wholeness of life and about the intensity of life, like there are in Israel, but also, as in Israel, I wanted that the echo chamber of fear of death and fear of loss will be very, very present, as it is in Israel. Israel has these two double layers, at least. And, and when, when it happened, probably the, the, the effect of loss, effect of tragedy, became even stronger. When did you know that you first wanted to write? And, you know, you're a writer of fiction and, and non-fiction. Is there one genre that you prefer over the other? Or Yeah, definitely. I'm, I prefer much more writing fiction. There is something in writing fiction, in inventing, in, in creating a whole world with its own constitution and its own codes. Creating characters. You know what, what it is to create a, a good character that suddenly becomes almost alive and... and you know everything about her or about him, uh, and and the, the the language that one can use in fiction and can use less in nonfiction. Even though I insist also in my nonfiction to use very personal and intimate language, because I think this is what really disarm people and and catch them by surprise, and suddenly they cannot benefit from their previous opinions. A, a new language, a, a more emotional, more nuanced language. Uh, so from all that you can understand, to, to, to write fiction is, in a way, there is a totality in it. From, from you, you, you start a whole world from scratch, while documentary, you come to a world that is already there and you just have to, to describe it as much as, in, in, in much precision as you can. Mm. Where do you see sort of the place of Israeli literature in the larger sort of panoply of, of global world literature? 
first of all, our literature is flourishing now. And, and wherever I go, in every country on earth, I see books translated from the Hebrew. And bear in mind, it's such a small country. We are seven million people. Uh, you know, half of uh, Holland, I think, or, or I don't know what part of France or of the United States. And yet there are so many Israeli books and Israeli writers who are translated abroad. I guess it has to do with the acuteness of our situation that is interesting for, for people from the outside. But the acuteness of the situation also produces sometimes very good literature. It also happens, not necessarily, not all the literature that we write is, is very good, but some of it, because of our extreme materials of life, has the option to become good story. But there is something more than that. I think that almost traditionally, from the dawn of days, the Jews and later Israel have provided big stories all the time. Just look at our... History from the Bible, of course, book of books, but also throughout history, you know, all, all the myths about the Jews and, and, of course, the story about Jesus and, and much later the, the, the legendary or the terrible protocols of the elderly people of Zion. And then the myth of Masada, for example, Metzada. And of course, the Shoah and the creation of Israel and the Six Day War. Every decade, huge story, larger than life story, to the extent that I suspect that we ourselves as a people, we are regarded as a story. We are not, to many others, we are not exactly flesh and blood people or flesh and blood individuals, but we are a kind of a parable of an allegory I don't like this position, by the way. I think that someone who becomes a story, someone who becomes also a, a story who is larger than life, in a way is not tuned to life in a normal and harmonious way. And, and I believe that only having peace, by the way, will ground us, will give us something that we never had, a kind of solidity of existence. I don't want to be a bigger or larger than life story. I want to be as big story as the Americans, the Italians, and Egyptians and Chinese. No more than that. Mr. David Grossman, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you.